Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much indeed, as always, for being here. The first interlull of the new season is done and dusted. And the first interlull of the new season has been a costly one on the injury front. Martin Odegaard sustaining an ankle injury in Norway's game against Austria. We don't yet at the time of recording know exactly how long he's going to be out for, but the early reporting is that he will miss the North London Derby on Sunday. He'll miss the Champions League game against Atalanta, and he'll miss next weekend's trip to Manchester City. And in all likelihood, he's going to be out for a little bit longer than that. So some suggestion it might be the far side of the next interlow before he is ready. How costly will that be? What is Mikel Arteta going to do to try and solve that particular problem, particularly when we don't have Declan Rice this weekend due to his absurd suspension following his red card in our last game against Brighton. So there is a lot to talk about from a footballing perspective, not to mention the fact that today Mikel Arteta signed a brand new contract with the club So we'll deal with all of that in just a moment. But this is a bit of a two-part show. Coming up a little bit later on, I will be talking to Tayo Papula about a brand new book called Black Arsenal. This was launched last week or the week before. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Tayo is one of the contributors, but we're going to take a broader look at that. And Tayo has put together a little piece, a kind of show within a show, if you like, talking to some of the other contributors. So that's coming up a little bit later on. But for now, we'll get on with the Arsenal chat straight away. And with me to do that from the Telegraph, it is Sam Dean. Hi, Sam. Hello. Thank you for having me again. My pleasure. We should start with Mikel Arteta today because he has signed a, a new contract with Arsenal, um, said all the right things about where he wants to go and what he wants to do. Not much of a surprise. I think this is one that they were keeping, not in reserve per se, but they wanted to get the transfer window out of the way so they couldn't be accused of taking their eye off any ball here, there, or anywhere. And the international break seems like a, a pretty good time to announce that. And maybe, given some of the other stuff that's happened during this international break, the timing of it is designed just to give a little bit of a boost ahead of what is a tricky run for Arsenal starting with uh, with Sunday's game, which we'll come to in due course, no doubt. Yeah, I um, I would agree with your suggestion about the timing. I think the timing is quite deliberate uh, on Arsenal's side. Or, or I, I put it this way, I would be surprised if the timing wasn't deliberate, um, mm. given the derby coming up and also given the sense of, not not fear, but there's definitely a, a darkened mood among Arsenal supporters as a result of Martin Odegaard's injury and also Calafiori's injury too, uh, but especially Odegaard. So yes, as you say, it's a, a timely boost. Um, and interesting as well to note, I think that if you remember, his previous contract extension was announced shortly before the transfer window, but I think at a time of a few games had been lost and it was almost like they used that then as a sort of PR opportunity to lift the mood at that point too. Mm. Um, but what was interesting this year was that when it was announced, the previous one was announced, one of the arguments for doing it at that time was to provide clarity ahead of the transfer window mm. to show potential targets that, look, Mikel's here for the long term. If you're going to come here, you're going to play for him. And I remember asking that question of Arteta at the end of last season, saying, do you not want to have that stability in place and, and that message to potential targets this year? And he sort of um, hopped around the answer a bit, but uh, I thought it was interesting that that was the rationale two years ago, but but not this year. Um, so it's interesting, um, but certainly not a surprise, as you say, that he has signed this. I think it was always a matter of time. That there, there was no suggestion. I don't think that he would... Uh, be happy to leave in a year's time. But yeah. Who knows? You know, there's a long way to go this season. But, well, the, uh, of oh, course. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the thing with football managers is you can give them a five-year contract, but, you know, things change so quickly in football. And I'm not trying to be a, a doomer here or anything like that, but the no. duration of it, I think, is two years on top of the year that he had left. So, you know, that's three years in total. It's something that Arsenal will probably have to revisit in, in two years' time because as a manager gets into the, the final year, assuming everybody's on the same page uh, at that point, it could be a, a relatively easy negotiation, but it doesn't um, it doesn't really vex me in any way. I've seen people wonder about, you know, is it a bit short? 
you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is is it different for managers? And of course, you know, everyone sort of every contract looks short when you're comparing them to you know Nicholas Jackson and Cole Palmer <laughs> getting nine years at Chelsea. Everything feels very short then. Yeah, well, Enzo Maresca got five years at Chelsea, um, but that's that's very much Chelsea. Um, yeah, I do understand a little bit people saying it feels a, quite short, but I think there's a couple of things on this. One is that by keeping it relatively short, which also we should say is what Pep Guardiola's done. He's signed two years extensions uh, on three separate occasions at Man City. Um, by keeping it quite short, from Arteta's side, it sort of um, allows him in two years' time, if Arsenal, say, have won the Premier League and Champions League, to renegotiate on better terms, mm-hmm. a pay rise that he would deserve in that scenario. Um, if he'd signed for six years now, he'd be signing on the same wage for six years. Obviously, with I'm sure like a player with increments based on on, on bonuses and, and where they finish and what they win. Um, and also for the club side, it doesn't tie them down to him in case something happens. And, mm. and, and that, as, as I say, I'm not trying to be a doomer either, but that is football and that does happen. Um, and, you know, it, 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 in, a, in a disastrous parallel universe, Arsenal lose the next five games and suddenly there's loads of pressure on. And if he'd signed a five-year deal, that wouldn't be wouldn't be ideal or the most financially prudent thing to do. So for both parties, I think it makes sense. Um, what I think will be really interesting with my long-term thinking on is whether Arteta will be around or will have the appetite to rebuild into a new cycle, mm. a, a new a new squad cycle, which I think probably 2027 would be around that time that it would be required. Um, if you look at the amount of emotional, mental and, and probably physical investment too that he has put into rebuilding this entire club, it would be a huge effort to go again in terms of the squad. Obviously, the foundations are in place, but that's what made Arsene Wenger and Sir Alex Ferguson and, and to a lesser extent Klopp and Guardiola so unique is that they were willing to do that rebuild. Klopp had two or three different teams at Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Guardiola's had two or three different teams at, at City and obviously Wenger and Ferguson go to that saying. Uh, I don't know and I imagine that Arteta doesn't really know either um, whether he will have the appetite to do that um, again with Arsenal. If he had signed till 2030, I suspect that would have indicated that he's intending to do that. But by going to 2027, that gives everyone the option to have a think in a couple of years' time and see yeah. exactly where they are. I suspect my hunch, and it's purely hunch, is that he'll be a bit burned out by the end of this contract now. And he'll need a break of some sort or a change of environment. I think I think he's he lives it so intensely and is so fundamental to so many different parts of the club that it will probably wear him down over time. But that's just my hunch. Yeah, I mean, it all depends what happens, of course, in the period of this next contract. Like, if Arsenal have the same season that they had last season and play so well and win so many games and and garner so many points but still don't win the title... I think to an extent that was something that happened to Jurgen Klopp. It just became exhausting. You know, regardless of how good you are, regardless of how well you build a team, regardless of the talent you have available to you, as we saw Liverpool at times, it was extraordinary the amount of points that they won but didn't win the title. I think there is a, an element where I'm not saying you give up, but you just sort of, there's a limit to what you can take because, you know, I think Klopp, like Arteta, is a very passionate guy and invested a lot emotionally and physically in these teams. The flip side, of course, is that, you know, if Arsenal win and win prizes and win trophies and, um, you know, achieve the things that I think Mikel Arteta really wants to achieve, like it feels like he and obviously some of the players have unfinished business um, and that is something that is going to drive them and motivate them. I wonder if you get to that point and think, yeah, I want more of this. I want more titles. I want more success in the Champions League, fingers crossed, whatever it might be, that you know, what happens in this period is, is going to be absolutely key. And I think maybe if we reflect, just sort of um, take the wider picture on this, that this particular contract is, like if the first part of it was sort of raising things to the ground – and then rebuilding, and then making progress, it feels like this particular contract is the one in which he probably, I, you know, I, I love everything that he's done, but like from a um, an external 
perspective, he needs to deliver, right? He needs to deliver the tangible success that football demands. Um, and I don't think, I, I don't say that as a way to sort of take away anything that he's done because I think it's it's been unbelievably successful without trophies. I, I, you know, I don't want to get into that whole argument like, can you be a successful team without trophies? Can you be a good team without trophies? I think, you know, Arsenal have, have shown that that is true. But perhaps more than the last time, the pressure will be on from him, I'm sure, but also the various external uh, sources, whether that's the ownership, whether that's the fan base, to put some silverware in the cabinet to break it down to brass tacks. Yeah, yeah. I I, um, I would say, just my opinion again is, he, he's putting the most pressure on himself to win more than anyone. I think, for example... Um, the club and the ownership would, would regard second or third place consistently as, you know, it's a really good season. It's done well. It's financially sustainable for the club. Everyone's moving in the right direction. But for him, he would never be happy with that. I think he's he is the most fiercely competitive of them all in mm. that kind of setup. And I think a lot of the players, too, that he's signed and the ones that he's built around feel the same. So I suspect that pressure and that drive to really win is probably bigger within Arteta's office and in the in the changing room than it is in the offices above. Yeah. Um, that would be my reading of it. And just quickly going back to the point on Klopp, I think I think two two factors that are relevant with the Klopp comparison. One is that Klopp was older. He'd been doing it for longer. Mm. And I think that burnout will therefore be be more intense. And also obviously I think people know that in COVID Klopp had very difficult personal circumstances, which obviously everyone did, but I think Klopp I think that I think by the sounds of it, that took quite a lot out of him um, being a long way from home and family and going through quite a lot of difficult things. Not to say that no other manager did, of course, sure. everyone did. Um, so he was older and therefore been doing it for longer and probably a bit more tired in that sense. And also Klopp had the problem of Guardiola was never going anywhere. Like with the Guardiola thing just seemed to be kept running and running. However long Klopp was going to be there, felt that yeah. Guardiola would be there too. Whereas for Arsenal and Arteta, there must be, and I'll never, I'll never say this publicly, but there must be an element of watching to see what happens at City, both with the, the Premier League case and also with Guardiola's future, given that his contract is is running out. So it is feasible, I think, to think, well, hang on, even if Arsenal finish second this year, next year could be totally different. Like the whole landscape could change. Mm. post prep landscape could be really very different. And I think Arsenal is sort of close enough to seeing that, that Arteta could probably buy into that and believe that more than perhaps Klopp could two years ago. Yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Well, you know, the deal is done. He's put pen to paper, and I think uh, everybody is is pretty happy with that. But as has been the story of Mikel Arteta's time at Arsenal, he's got a lot going on. You know, from the <laughs> from the day he arrived until yeah, yeah. right now, there's always some shit going on for him. And this international break, um, you know, has presented some challenges. Obviously, the Declan Rice red card against Brighton was enough of a challenge going into a North London derby, and all the discussion was about, well, who do we replace uh, Declan Rice with in this team for the North London derby? Nobody was thinking about, well, we've got to replace Declan Rice and Martin Odegaard. Martin Odegaard um, fell victim to the international break. Uh, Looks like a relatively serious uh, ankle injury, certainly one that's going to keep him out for a few weeks. We don't quite know what the um, what the prognosis is yet. He's had some scans at Arsenal, I think. Um, but I, I I suspect, as they tend to do these days, they, they'll play their cards relatively close to their chest in terms of a time frame with him. But that, on top of a potential injury to Ricardo Calafiori as well, It's given him a lot to think about going into this North London derby. I did want to ask you about about Odegaard in particular. And, you know, I saw a lot of discussion about how maybe Arsenal need to be a bit more cynical about players going away on international duty. Maybe advise them strongly that they should stay at home uh, for one or two of these international breaks. And we've seen it happen um, with other clubs and other managers. Is it really feasible to tell a player you can't go on international duty? Can they be more persuasive and say, maybe you shouldn't go and play 
90 minutes against Kazakhstan. Do Norway really need you? I mean, they drew that game nil-nil, so even with Odegaard, they didn't get what they wanted from it. But mm. but that whole discussion about whether or not clubs should be a little more strict and maybe the responsibility of a player as well where you know they want to play, they want to represent their country, they, they feel pride uh, in doing that and... Um, Maybe at times, I'm not saying this is true of Martin Odegaard, but a player won't be quite as forthcoming about a physical problem because they want to go away and they want to play in uh, in the international games. Do you have a strong opinion on any of that either way, or is this just one of those unfortunate things that happens in international breaks? I think my my strong opinion is that if a player wants to go and has been selected, then it Arsenal should not be trying to stop him. To be honest. Um, from what I know of Martin Odegaard, he really wants to play for his country. He's the captain. And crucially, Norway have been massively underperforming for quite a few years. And I'm certain that he feels a bit of pressure on that to fix that, given the quality in their team and the fact that they've got arguably the two best Premier League players, both in the same eleven, mm. but they can't get to the European Championship is quite extraordinary and obviously a source of huge discussion back home. So I very much would not expect Odegaard to be looking for excuses to get out of it. And for example, you know, if you remember going back 15, 20 years, how Ryan Giggs used to often not turn up for yeah. Wales duty, that, st- that stuck with him. When he got appointed as the Wales manager, it was one of the first questions he was asked about his commitment to the cause and how he never sort of went out of his way to play and how he always tried to find for the first reason to not turn up. So I think players are conscious of that too. And even look at the reaction to the Ben White situation, which is very different, but along the same code of lines and you know it's it's pretty vitriolic it's pretty yeah. it's pretty strong the, the idea of representing your country and showing sort of patriotic pride that that is a that is a, a constant talking point and i can see why players are, are are conscious of of that and also with odegaard to be honest i mean he's been so good at avoiding injury and that's partly through luck and also a big part through his own work and, and he works very hard on his fitness on his on his body and on staying in shape that I can see why he wouldn't he wouldn't have doubts about going. Mm. I mean, if, for example, he'd been managing a niggle for the last six months, then it would make more sense. But as far as we know, he's been fully fit, playing every game, playing every minute. There would be no reason for him to worry about going and playing two more games in mm. two weeks. So, uh, you know, a bit like Declan Rice, he's so indestructible. There's no, no one questions him playing for England, really. Then the one time he tweaks his hamstring will be the time this debate kicks off. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, you know, it's different for players who've come back from long injuries. Like if, for example, Timber went to the Euros, I think Arsenal would probably have been quite alarmed by that. And I'm sure a lot of Arsenal supporters would be. But in this case, I think it's very hard to tell the captain of Norway to not go and play for Norway. Isn't it also just part of the character of players of Odegaard's quality? That, it, you know, to be that good, you have to be that dedicated to every aspect of the game, whether it's club... Uh, games, whether it's international games, whether it's training, and if a player is... Look, I, I think there is maybe an argument to be made where sometimes a little bit of common sense could come into it, where if it's a meaningless kind of game, a player could say, look, I, I want to sit this one out. As you said, these were, I don't know, you know, Nations League, how high that rankles or ranks on anybody's um, sense of importance, but mm. it does uh, become part of the the, the qualifying and, uh, and all that. But I think if you... If you want to extract the best from uh, a character like Martin Odegaard, I don't know that you can sort of take a little bit away um, by asking him not to go, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? I think just yeah. they're that driven. They want to be part of of every game, for better or worse. And look, Manchester City sent their only striker to play two international games this week. Is it good luck that he didn't get injured and bad luck that Odegaard got injured? It's, you know. Yeah, basically, yeah. But also, you have to bear in mind with Odegaard, like, he made his international debut at the age of 15. He's got the most intense scrutiny ever in Norway. Mm. Like, we we think the, the press in Britain is quite sort of intense and, and arguably intrusive. I think less so these days, thankfully, tabloid wise. But in Norway, it's massive. It's massive. Anything he does, like his girlfriend, where he goes, growing a beard, it's all massive, massive <laughs> news. Like he can't, he can't avoid it. It's very much like Beckham used to be in the in the sort of early noughties, late nineties in England. So, like for him to just say, actually, I think I should take this one off, guys. Like mm. 
that would be a huge deal. Can you imagine the, the sort of the stick he'd get, the reputational damage it would do to him? Like, I don't think that's really an option. What I would say is, you know, the manager could help. He could play him for 60 minutes rather than 90, for example. But equally, he's trying to maintain his own job and get results and all those things. So it's really tricky. and it's, it's not as black and white, I think. And I do understand how Arsenal fans reacted emotionally to it. But it's, it's not as black and white as just don't send him. No, it's, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. I mean, your point there about playing him for 60 minutes and not 90 minutes is a great one. But it begs the question, who, who plays uh, for the other 30 minutes in that position, which is now the headache that Mikel Arteta has to deal with, not just for the North London derby, but Manchester City away, Arsenal's first Champions League game, maybe some more fixtures all the way to to the next interlull. You know, I think if you if you're missing a player like Declan Rice for one game because of a ridiculous suspension, you know, you can you can find a sticking plaster solution for one game, right? But with a player like Odegaard, who's so influential in this Arsenal team, who's so fundamental to the way that Arsenal play, and I don't just mean his creativity, I mean the way he leads the press, his tactical intelligence, the way he guides the team on the pitch, there isn't really another player in the team or in the squad right now who will slot into that role. I mean, we can maybe talk in, in a minute about Ethan Waneri's credentials as, you know, a slightly uh, like-for-like -like replacement in that he's a left-footed uh, attacking midfield player. But I think there is a lot for uh, for Ethan Waneri still to learn about the game, whereas Odegaard, of course, has got all this experience and, and is so crucial. So, when Mikel Arteta, you know, puts the champagne away tonight after signing his new deal and he sits down to think about what he's going to do, it isn't just a case of thinking who is going to play there. It is how Arsenal are going to cope without the other aspects of, of, of Odegaard's game. Yeah, completely. And uh, not to jump the gun on the Winery discussion, but also who the opponent is. Mm. Like if if this had happened to Odegaard four days before Arsenal played Ipswich at home, with respect to Ipswich, sure, then possibly you can see the argument for saying, well, in the squad on the depth chart, Waneri is the understudy to Odegaard, the right sided number eight, left footed, creative playmaker. Let's slot him in, see what he can do. But to give a seventeen year old kid his first start for the club away at Spurs, it's just like. Can you? I mean, there's there's dropping someone in the deep end, and then there's that. That's that's chucking him in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's just extraordinarily high pressure environment. So I'd be very very surprised if not completely stunned uh, if Waneri starts the game, even though technically he is the understudy mm. to Odegaard. But yeah, as you say, I'm sure Arteta has been thinking about this over a glass of champagne, if if not uh, for a few a few days now, and it, it seems pretty certain to me that Havertz will have to play in midfield. The old, uh, the original plan from last year, get it back out the shelf, dust it off, mm. <laughs> try again, basically, which um, I think will be a shame for Arsenal, given how good Havertz is as a striker and given how much he really did struggle as a midfielder. But I don't really see an alternative um, uh, beyond perhaps playing Sterling as a 10 or maybe Saka in midfield too, but yeah. both of those feel like such drastic changes for such a big game. That I just can't see Arteta pulling the trigger on that. What do mm. you think? I'm, I'm, I tried to think about all the things he could do. You know, could he play? Could he play Saka there? And that was a thought that crossed my mind. Was um, is it ideal to take one of the best players in the world in their position and put them in a different position? Uh, n far from it. But when you're thinking about you know where you've got a bit of strength and depth, it is maybe in the front three now that Sterling has arrived and you've got Martinelli, you've got Sterling, you've got Trossard to fill those positions. So it did occur to me that Saka might be an option. Zinchenko, I know he's never showed any inclination whatsoever about playing him there, but certainly on paper an option. Like mm. you, I'd be very surprised if it were Nwaneri, given the given the, the, the fixtures that we have available to us or ahead of us, rather, the Man City, of course, um, next weekend and then Spurs this weekend. 
I mean, there's a baptism of fire and then there's a baptism of fire. There's also a yeah. part of me that really, really wants to see it. You know, <laughs> if like if 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 Arteta picked one area there, it would say to me and to you and I'm sure everybody listening that he feels this kid is ready. He can do it because like there's the one, well, one of the things we've learned about Arteta over the years is that if he feels a young player is not ready, he won't put them in a position where they could be damaged by the experience that they have on the pitch. I think he mm. said that quite explicitly a couple of times. So if we if we see Sunday, 1 o'clock or 12.45, whenever the team comes out and he's in it, that to me would be tremendously exciting because it would suggest a faith in his ability to slot into that role. And we know he's been mentoring with Odegaard. So, you know, is that something? But I, I think I would be a bit surprised. I think he's going to have to come up with something, particularly as well in the absence of Declan Rice, he's going to have to come up with something a little bit different for this game. And then, you know, maybe when Rice is back, he's got the ability to be a little more flexible about how he replaces Odegaard. Yeah, yeah, I think... I think um... I'd be a lot less surprised if Winery is involved against Atlanta, for example. Mm. I think that's not to criticise Atlanta, but obviously a derby at Spurs is just the most extraordinarily tough setting in which to make your debut. Um, and also, from what I know of Winery and from what's been said about him in, internally, the talent's obviously there. Like the technique, you can see that the, the way his physical development has happened. Like in preseason, it was obvious that he was. A first team player now yeah but there, as you mentioned before on, on Odegaard there are tactical and positional requirements in this system that he is still learning and sort of when to hold your position when to go and and most importantly probably when when to press mm -hmm. and how to do it and against Spurs who will build up from the back you've got to be on it you've got to be sharp if you're a second late then Spurs are out and you're in big trouble so I think the thought of sending him in off the ball will probably be the biggest concern rather than on the ball. Yeah. On the on the ball, it's quite clear he has he has the ability required to be there, which is why he is there, and that's why yeah. Fabio Vieira isn't. Yes. the The other thing, I suppose, is how Arteta will react to this with the players that he has available to him for this game. Like for Arsenal fans, and you know, I, I saw the Odegaard injury, and it was like. A, uh, kick in the stomach um, on top of the Declan Rice thing going into a derby like there's no way you could pretend that that's a scenario that anyone had envisaged or that anybody would want where I'm you know sort of really curious about the message he sends ahead of this game and I guess we'll see in tomorrow's press conference is is how he how he uh, what's the word I'm looking for here how he speaks weaponizes it. Yeah, in in a way, yeah. Because yeah. I, I think there's you know, Declan Rice and Martin Odegaard are two brilliant players, right? No question about it. And any team in the world I think would miss those two players. But sometimes you can be a team which has two really good players like that who absolutely carry the team. The drop off in quality to everybody else is is vast. Whereas I think what Arsenal have in this current squad are a lot of extremely good players on the same level in different positions, obviously, as Declan Rice and Martin Odegaard. Like, that back four is amazing. The keeper has been playing brilliantly. But Kaio Saka, as we said, one of the best in the world. Uh, you've got Kai Havertz, when he plays up front, has been absolutely outstanding in every game uh, that he's played and, and what he delivers. So, you know, Arsenal fans, I think, are absolutely right to be unhappy and maybe a little bit fearful about you know missing those two players for Arteta I think he's got to ha he's going to have to present this to his squad as a challenge that they're going to have to rise to like the season will present you with challenges from from August to May and the job is to go out in that football pitch and win games and score goals and take the points like Arsenal fans can sit here and we can cry and we can be very unhappy about it but the players they have to just get on with the job. And I think that is that is where I think it's going to be very interesting to hear what he says in this press conference. Like, you're going to be tested um, more than ever. Can you rise to that challenge? And, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. I think he will try and use that as a, as a, a motivating factor in, in as much as you can. Like, he's got to try and find some sort of silver lining when he's having his uh, team meetings and preparing for these games. Yeah, it's a... It's a classic 
siege mentality opportunity. And knowing what we know of, of Arteta and his motivational techniques, I wouldn't be surprised if they're all, you know, watching 300 or something like that and sort of learning <laughs> about Sparta and that sort of thing, like going in, going into the lion's den and, you know, you're missing your leader and your, and your 105 million pound central midfielder. How are you going to stand up to the challenge? And I, 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 I have no doubt that the players will be um, sort of given all those tools that Arteta can think of. I think just 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 on the on the issue, I think, and this is not to be too uh, uh, downbeat about it, but I think one of the big problems that Arsenal have got is that effectively, in normal circumstances, one of their greatest strengths is the sort of synchronicity of the system and mm-hmm. how everything is slick and it fits together. And it's almost like clockwork that Ben White can close his eyes, but he'll still know where Odegaard and Saka will be. To to lose one player from that is kind of fine because you can just plug someone else into that system. And Arteta actually speaks about when he makes changes like that, he often likes to make one change rather than two. Mm. So, for example, bringing Saka in from the right wing to midfield would be two changes because it requires a new right winger. So I think, I think you know, you can plug one in and keep the system going as they do when they, they put Rice as a left eight or Trossard as a left eight or Havertz as a left eight. But to lose two of the three midfielders, I think, requires them to change the shape because Partey and Jorginho, neither of them can play as a sort of box-to-box eight. And if the shape's not the same, then that synchronicity mm. won't be the same either. So that one of the Arsenal's greatest strengths is that system being so slick but it becomes one of their biggest weaknesses at a time like this when suddenly the patterns they're reliant on and have built for so many years now aren't going to be the same the autumn the ultimate what's the word they automatisms. Use? automatisms automatisms <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah they're not going to be the same so it's going to be really different for every single player on the pitch um and that i think is something that if i was an arsenal fan would be quite concerning mm. I mean, the argument as well, the the flip side of that maybe is that, you know, the players know the system so well, maybe they don't know uh, each particular role, but they understand, you know, what they're being asked to do and, and could maybe slot in. There There isn't a lot of time, though, is there? Players have only just come back yeah. from international duty. He's got a couple of days to prepare and a couple of days to to think about team selection. And I presume training sessions this week will reflect his thinking on the team um but we'll have to see if they can if they can produce um but it is that is just sorry sorry just thinking out thinking out loud really i think that talk about automatisms and the system that's what makes me think actually maybe bringing saka into midfield could make sense because he having worked so closely with Odegaard for so many years years now, mm. he kind of knows what that role is, even though he's not done it himself. He could probably understand where Odegaard should be and when because he's got that hundreds of hours of reference point in his mind sort of sure. baked in. And then you could put Sterling right wing and say, just play like you did at City, please, and just do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's still, as you say, seems seems slightly unlikely. Yeah, we'll we'll have to wait and see what he does. Like we said, he's got uh, plenty of thinking to do and lots of uh, pieces to move around the chalkboard. Um, Sunday will tell us anyway. Uh, for now, though, we better leave it there. Sam, as ever, thanks a million. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sorry for rambling. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> No doubt many of you have seen over the last couple of weeks the launch, a couple of launches of a book called Black Arsenal by Clive Nwanka and Matthew Harl. With me to talk about that and to go a little bit in depth on this uh, incredible publication, delighted to welcome back as always, Tayo Papula. Hello there. Hello, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. First, you know, tell me just in broad strokes or tell the listeners in broad strokes, you know, what this book is about uh, and how it was put together. Okay, so the book is called Black Arsenal Club Culture and Identity. And it was put together by uh, Dr. Clive Nwonka and um, somebody called Matthew Harl, who's a a big Arsenal fan who I met um, when he was working at the Barbican. And how it came about, or how my um, involvement in it came about and what the book's about is I went along to a talk called Black Arsenal and it was just about exploring the identity of the club from from a black perspective mm. why why um black fans have been drawn or f- fans of color um, have been drawn to the arsenal the role that the club has played um 
from, I mean, someone who's been very involved in it from the start, who I saw talk, um, first of all, at the Barbican and then at the launch the other day was um, Paul Davis, who spoke really, really eloquently and emotionally about his involvement in the club. Um, Because, you know, being a bit older, his position in being a bit older than, say, some of the names that we're more familiar with, like, um, you know, Rocky and Michael Thomas and, of course, Ian Wright, along with, you know, Chris White, were one of the first players at the club at a time when it wasn't so common and at the time when there was a lot more challenges, shall we say. So, you know, that's, that's one angle of it i talked about my relationship with the club which i'll say a bit more about in a minute you there's professor paul gilroy our very own clive palmer um who we all know very well and love um has had a contribution as well so there's so many conversations about arsenal's role in the community um and yeah for me what it did really well was to put into words other people's words how I felt about the club and why I felt about the club, you know? So it's a it's a sociological study of the club, but it's also a fan's eye view and mm. hopefully it's something that we can all relate to. Um it's a it's it's a beautiful hardback book. Um it covers a lot of conversations that I and lots of other Arsenal fans have had. Um and yeah I'm really proud to and uh, yeah and I'm really proud to have a have have a part in it. The inclusivity that you talk about, obviously, I don't know if people take it for granted now, but when you mention Paul Davis and when you mention you know, the, the period at which he made his breakthrough, it certainly was a lot more challenging for Arsenal uh, or for players at that time, I should say, but also for fans, I'm sure, you know, that there were societal issues to deal with on an ongoing basis and whether Arsenal was like, I don't know, like a release at the end of the week or something that you could go to at the end of the week and get away from all of that stuff. I, I don't quite, I don't quite know, but do those two things sort of go hand in hand for you? The emergence of, of black players, not just at Arsenal, but I think Arsenal was very much at the forefront of that, certainly, but black heroes as well, the names that you've mentioned you know, your own experience and, and the experience of these other contributors uh, as well uh, during that period at a time where, you know, outside of that, uh, I don't want to call it a bubble, but outside of that sphere, if you like, there were many other things to be dealt with on an ongoing basis. Absolutely. A few years back, Andrew, I made a program uh, for Radio 4 called The Black Footballer's Dilemma. And it was about and it was 40 years from Viv Anderson's debut as the Mm. first black player to play for England. And in that program, I actually spoke to Paul Davis then. And he spoke, as I say, really, really well, as as did um, a lot of other players from a lot of other clubs, Garth Crooks, um, Paul Mortimer from uh, Charlton, um, John Barnes um, spoke really well about the challenges, not only on the pitch, but as you say, on the terraces as well and it was a very difficult time to be on the terraces i've spoken to older fans than myself who had those experiences a bit more by the time i started going to football there were more black faces on the terraces Mm -hmm. um and as you've mentioned there were more black players like we had like our cohort of like me south london gooners coming through the club like um i mean paul davis is one but michael thomas um Kevin Campbell, um, David Rowcastle, and of course, for, uh, well, Ashley Cole as well. But of course, for me, Ian Wright, who had a very big, who played such a huge part in mine and so many other Arsenal fans' yeah. understanding of the club, basically. And it was just important to have, you know, we we talk about it now about the idea of seeing it to be it, right? So to see yourself. And this is what gets talked about in the book quite a lot, to see yourself represented on the pitch, to see these guys doing the dance of the day, the bogle by the corner flag. And you're thinking they could just be as well down carnival as they could be in front of the North Bank, you know. And for a teenager looking for heroes, it was great to have yourself not so much yourself represented um on the pitch but you thought that those guys on the pitch had a little bit of you in them Mm. 
And that was important, much like the uh, there's a generation before who, you know, you hear the conversation quite a lot about how the idea of uh, Charlie George, he, he seemed like he jumped over the terraces just to go onto the pitch. So there's that, you know, there's that connection for that generation of fan, or especially from, you know, that North London fan. Sure. It felt the same for for me, for us, with some of these players, and certainly with Ian Wright, who I've spoken about many, many times, as as we all have, um, about his importance. And I also want to say, Andrew, that yeah. the point of this book, it's not Black Arsenal in exclusion of anything else. This is just about, this is a part of support, supporting Arsenal from a black or brown perspective. It's also about the inclusivity of the club. Mm. So it's weird that you have to say that in these times, but in such a binary world where people want to say, well, what about X, Y, Z? Or, sure. you know, the what about the what about? Like, it's not about that. It's a celebration of the club, the culture, the identity of Arsenal and what it's meant to people like me. Sure. So that's really important to, to, to say, not least because in the book, you know, there's contributions from your very own, our very own James McNicholas. Sure. Um, there's contributions from Amy Lawrence. So it's not just like a, it's not to the exclusion of anything else. It's just, it's, it's important to say that. No, I agree. I think, it, you know, if, you know, we all consider Arsenal, something amazing and great what makes it that is the sum of all its parts not just one thing or the other thing all of these things that arsenal do community-wide worldwide are part of what connects us with uh, with this football club and and makes us you know not always but very often proud of what they do and, and how they do it you know so this is just another part of that a hundred a hundred percent and mm. you know other clubs can and will say the same thing um crystal palace have always had a, a a cohort of black players, which you know John Salako, Mark Bright, um, Ian Andy Wright. Gray, and Ian Wright again <laughs> um, was, was 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 were really important. Um, uh, were really important to me, and I mean I can only talk about the experience of um, Paul Cannonville at Chelsea for an just for an example sure. of how things can and were different. Um, Arsenal without not you know Arsenal's not without fault of course it isn't but Arsenal has been a welcoming inclusive celebratory celebratory place um and one that I felt really part of and I've said this a few times recently in fact I said this to Tim Stillman uh, the day of um the Leverkusen game recently the day of the Leverkusen game was the same day as the far right were supposed to be marching on Walthamstow and there was a you know there was a huge gathering there was a really oppressive atmosphere i left for the for the game for the friendly from Walthamstow mm. and it was a really really dark time over the summer for you know in a, in a, in a triggering way for you know for for, for many people of color with the, with the you know with the noise that was around and I just remember that day. Obviously, it was the first. It felt like the first day of the season, anyway. So there was, so there was that kind of enjoyment of being back. But I went from somewhere edgy and with some anger around to a place of celebration um, of different races, religions, sexuality. You know, all under this kind of Arsenal banner, and it just felt really important to me that day much so much as carnival notting hill carnival has always been important to me as a celebration of what we really are as as londoners or as people that day it felt really really important to go somewhere where those kind of barriers and that kind of exclusion uh, wasn't a feature well you know if that doesn't sum it up i don't know what does you've put together uh, a little podcast within a podcast to talk a little bit more and to talk to some of the people involved in this book and to explore some of the themes of the book. Uh, and I'm very grateful uh, to you for doing that. And thank you very much indeed. So will we take it away from here and leave this next part to you? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you as well to you for making space for this and giving me the opportunity to do it. Um, I spoke to a couple of people from from the book for, with, a, with a relationship to Arsenal. 
Um, but yeah, see for yourself. Thanks a lot. Let's do it. Hello and welcome along to a special podcast within a podcast. My name is Tayo Papula and today the Arse Cast becomes the Black Arse Cast for one night only. Celebrating the Black Arsenal book recently released. In the autumn of 2022, I went along to an event at the Barbican called Black Arsenal. On the stage that night, I heard some amazing speakers articulating feelings I'd had about this club, but hadn't thought about putting into words. This Black Arsenal book does that. Edited by Clive Nwonka and Matthew Hull. It was Matthew Hull who came up to me that night in the bar afterwards and persuaded me, cajoled me into writing something for this book. My contribution talks about Norman Jay, Ian Wright, of course it does, Viv Richards, Thierry Henry, heroes and superheroes. When Andrew asked me to do something on this book, I knew I wanted to talk to a diverse range of contributors in this book. First up in today's podcast, you're going to hear from an Arsenal fan, a London boy, a Nigerian boy, so I just knew that I'd have a lot in common. Femi Colioso is part of the Mercury Prize winning Amazing Ezra Collective. Even though we're a generation apart, I just knew that our experiences would be similar. I had a great chat with him, I hope you think so too. Starting things off on today's Black Arsenal podcast is my chat with Femi Colioso. <laughs> First of all, I mean, we were just saying it off mic, but first of all, what a pleasure it is to talk to you. I will say that I appreciate you, what you're doing at the moment as a artist and to find out that you are a mad Arsenal fan as well, as well as being a Nigerian, all of which we'll get into. No, honestly, thank you so much for having me. I think one thing I always end up telling people is like being a musician for a living. I've met some incredible artists, some, some of my favourite musicians ever, and I don't often get starstruck by musicians but then when it comes to the deeper passion which is football and Arsenal if you tell me you were like on the bench for a fourth division team in in Germany I just get starstruck and oh my gosh you can play football do you know what I mean so even talking to you I listen to you on the train on the plane all over the place so even talking to you in person just means a lot so thank you honestly thank you for having me bless you and I, um, I felt the same and Let's get into it. So you were born in 1994. Tell me about yeah. your first World Cup, first of all. Okay, so being born in 1994, my first conscious, mm-hmm. this is what I love, World Cup, it was 2002. And it was just so significant because I think I, I like gotten into football just before then. But, you know, I'm still about you know, seven, eight years old when this is kicking off. But the group stages just took my interest in a deeper way because in the same group was Argentina, Sweden, Nigeria and England. Mm -hmm. So immediately beyond the obvious connection to Nigeria, I've now got a connection to the Arsenal as well because you've got Ashley Cole playing at left back You've got Freddie Lundberg playing at right mid. And then I've got Canu playing up front. So that group stage kind of was everything I needed for football. And then what's the most perfect thing that can happen at a World Cup? Brazil win. That's like the most World Cup thing that can happen. And that is what happened. And they won in a fantastic way. So that World Cup kind of was me hooked on football forever, if you know. Yeah, so, th- I mean, the reason why I wanted to start with that, so you were eight for that World Cup, eight going on nine. For yeah, that around that age, year two, um, yeah. You know, I'm, I was born in 1975, so a little bit longer than that. But yeah. we had the same super interest in that World Cup because we had one of our own, didn't we? We had Kanu. Talk to me about yes. what Kanu has meant to you. You know, the intersection of so yeah. many parts of you and I land on Nwanko Kanu. So let's talk about that. A hundred percent. I think one of the most powerful things about football is the role of representation it plays. It's just such a beautiful thing that so many people can watch these 22 people in a field and be like, that one has my name or that one looks like me. And that's what Carnu was for me. 
he was playing in red and white, but he had a Nigerian name. That is who I felt like I was. And this is at a very young age as well. And then, of course, your first introduction to football, what do we all want to be? We want to be a striker. We want to score goals. And that's what Kanu did, you know. So it was like such a beautiful representation I found in that man. And so it immediately became a football player I just adored because it was like, it was just great and even greater than playing for Arsenal. He then goes and plays in green, white, green in the summer. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's that's what he meant to me initially. And till this day, he's someone that I just like always looked up to, a hero of mine, you know? Yeah, I think it's really important about that, as you say, representation, and I'll come back to that. The only problem I had with Kanu is that he was six foot seven. Or yes. whatever he is. And I, I like can relate my, to that. I like my heroes down here. Yeah, you know I mean yeah. I'm not <laughs> I'm not that no, tall. Yeah. Um so for me, JJ Okocha. JJ yeah. Okocha is the one that got away. The fact that he would never play for us hurts me a little well, bit. <laughs> do you know what's so mad about JJ Okocha? The first time I ever watched an Arsenal match, Highbury, two thousand and four, February, Arsenal Bolton. I saw JJ Okocha. That was the first game I ever went to. And do you remember when he rainbow flicked you? I saw that, man. <laughs> yeah, I remembered kind of half thinking, obviously you want Arsenal to win, but if JJ could get a goal, that would be great. Do you know what I mean? So talk about that a little bit more, because you mentioned in your in your excerpt in, um, in the book about yes. there was a little bit of us in Ian Wright so talk about how important it was and also you talked really well about this at the Black Arsenal launch at the club yeah yeah I mean one of the things that I think is so powerful about Ian Wright is his accent he sounds so London he, t- he talks like me do you know what I mean like it would be hard for me to do an impression of him because it's just like a slightly more vintage version of the way that I speak you know and when you see him, like, he had such a swag about him, such a London energy about him, you end up seeing yourself in it. And then I think to when Alex Iwobi scored his first ever goal for Arsenal and he did, like, a machine gun celebration, there's nothing more London than doing something like that when you just score the goal for the Gunners. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of like all of those moments of representation is what makes like Arsenal or football so powerful. There were so many players, past and present, that I just see see them doing their thing and I just think I'm a little bit like that. You know? Even like Patrick Vieira doesn't have my accent. He 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 speaks with a French accent. He comes from a different part of West Africa. But he had this London energy about him when he was just about to get a red card. It was just you recognise it from school, do you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of like all of that kind of ends up having this big word that you'd call identity. You find your identity in the club, you know, and that it's just powerful. Do you know what I mean? And when, so when you talk to fans like me, you know, I'm, I'm just as passionate as the next fan, go to all the games I can, absolutely Arsenal mad, but I'm not going to lose my love for this club if they play badly, because it's just like the same way. If I have a bad day at work, I don't just lose my love for myself. I see myself in the club. And that's kind of like a very powerful thing that I think the club itself is really good at homing into, you know. A little bit more, please, about the kind of inclusivity that you felt on that subject. And again, this is something you talk about in the book about how Arsenal has seemed to kind of permeate through different social groups. Yeah, 100%. I mean, just like you mentioned, beyond it just being black, so many different types of people feel included by Arsenal. My introduction to Arsenal was being a junior gunner. The first time I went, I'm seven, eight years old. And when you go, when you sit at the junior gunner part of the stadium, right next to that is the accessibility part of the stadium. And you see just how welcomed every single member of that Arsenal fan base is. A close friend of my dad's, he's blind but has a season ticket and they've got a whole sensory thing so that he can feel just as involved And these are all of my access points to the club, to the team. And then more powerful than, well, not even more powerful, but just as powerfully, I'm a black boy with Nigerian parents and I'm a Londoner. And I'm sat next to my best mate, Tolga, who's a Turkish, Turkish North Londoner. 
There's nothing more North London than a Turk and a Nigerian sat right next to each other supporting Arsenal together. Do you hear what I'm saying? And it's like all of those things end up being such a big part of Arsenal's culture and therefore I just feel included by it. I wanted to come on to London because mm. I mentioned the the 20 year difference, not just to make myself feel old, but it's interesting that 20 years later, 20 years down the line, you feel the same as I do. At the Arsenal launch, at the Black Arsenal launch, you spoke really well about London and yeah. how it's not English, it's not even British, it's London. Yeah. Can you just like, yeah. can you just expand on that again and explain why yeah. the London identity and Arsenal's place within that was so important for you? Yeah, no, 100%. I think it's just one of those things where, so I'm born and bred London. I'm born in London. I've only ever lived in North London in my life. But my parents are Nigerian, came over from Nigeria and then had me here in London. And so the word English has never actually really worked for me by way of my identity. I don't actually consider myself English. A lot of people with a similar upbringing to me probably would, and that's totally cool. But for me personally, England has English has never really worked for me. I see it as something slightly different. And then if you go one step, it kind of removed from English, you have the term British. And I kind of get that. But then when I think of the word British, sometimes it comes with the like colonization kind of element to that word and the British Empire, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So even though I can kind of get behind the term British, maybe it's not my favourite version of the identity. But you see the word Londoner? Now that to me is that like that is who I am I sound like a Londoner I dress like a Londoner I look like a Londoner do you hear what I'm saying everywhere I go in the world people hear the way I speak and they're like yeah London they would never say Birmingham Liverpool or Manchester they would always say London and so then one of the most beautiful things when you're proud of your identity I'm so proud to be a Londoner I just want a t-shirt and a flag and a colour to go with that I want a national anthem What's my national anthem at the moment? North London forever. What's my flag? It's, it's red and white. That's my T-shirt. Do, you know, do you know what I'm saying? And so Arsenal ends up representing this identity that I most closely aligned to. And I think loads of people are in a similar type of place and way with the word Londoner and then connecting it to Arsenal, you know? I mean, I always say I'm more Lambeth than Lagos. You know what I mean? Oh, 100%. Because I, I was born in yeah. St. Thomas's Hospital. My parents... Yeah my family are Nigerian 100% yeah. um, and for me um, I didn't really support England until 1996 when I was 21 and there was the okay. of England in, um, and I think one of the reasons for that was in 94 when England didn't qualify Nigeria did mm. Yeah. So I had, right there, I had Amakachi I had Rashida Yakini um, yeah, shaking yeah. the net and, um, and there's also a feeling of like Football hasn't always been for us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like I've got friends who went to England matches and had a bad time. London was the identity that, that I felt comfortable with. Music was another reason why I could go. Clubland, yeah. Jungle um, yeah, was a place where I could go and the colour didn't matter because we were all Londoners. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was a big no. thing. One other very London thing I want to ask you about. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing, apart from Arsenal, for me, which is which makes me so proud to be a Londoner, is Carnival. Oh, this is something else as well. And Arsenal won Carnival this year. I don't know if you went, but... It That's was such very... a weird thing to say. You said this year, every year. Every year. Arsenal, yeah, Arsenal yeah, yeah, tops I'll... everywhere. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? But this year was like particularly like... It felt like a, a bit of a battle. It felt like a home match. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right. The shirts everywhere as well yeah kind of thing that you know the, did you partake did you wear your shirt i didn't i wore my nigerian shirt i wore my Niger I, okay i, I wore it i, wore I my, did the same thing i mean also because it was green and green for grenfell as well nice. so it was a little thing um for that but i did want to ask you um because the arsenal shirt very much like the nigerian shirt you know how in 98 everyone was wearing sorry you know how in um, 2018 everyone was wearing the nigerian, the nigerian shirt yeah as a fashion item do you remember the drama of trying to get that strip i was like it sold out everywhere. It was really hard and not to say to someone when I saw it, going, listen, bruv. Yeah, I'm, Nigerian like, I'm actually, one. What do, you mean? do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> when was the last time you had a good season? Do you know what I mean? But like, I remember, um, you know, begging. 
I need that kit, I need that kit, just trying my best, couldn't get it, looking for fakes, I just wanted to fit in, you know, and then we were about to do Field Day Festival with Ezra Collective, and I got into my dressing room, and there was just this brown, brown bag, and it said, with love from Nike, I was, I've never felt more superstar in my life, I think they got the, they got the hint that I'd be desperate for it, but I think, I think all of those kits, and you know, the Arsenal kit being all over Carnival. I feel like Arsenal has just played such a massive part in London culture in a way that maybe some of the other London teams haven't quite done. So, you know, there's a lots of there's lots of amazing teams in London from, you know, Barnet, Crystal Palace, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They represent big chunks of the city, but I feel like Arsenal Football Club maybe because of the legacy left by people like Ian Wright and continued by people like Bukayo Saka, there's like an identity attachment to that club that makes it so relevant to where at Nottingham Carnival. And then, you know, and their understanding of that culture and that attachment was no more kind of poetically displayed by them releasing that, like, Jamaica kit, that Jamaica-Arsenal crossover. And... And it was just such a perfect celebration. It didn't look forced or it didn't come across wrong. Like, it looked so right. Do you know what I'm saying? And even having, like, Emil Smith-Rowe advertise that kit, it was, like, very, very perfect. And, yeah, I think it's just it just ties into a lot of what I've been saying. Like, a lot of people see their identity in this club, you know? You talk about Ian Wright being, you know, the nation's uncle. The nation's son, Yeah, of course, is Bukayo Saka. Can you tell me what it's like having someone, the next generation of black Arsenal superstar there in front of you? The fact that someone like Bukayo Saka is ours. I think the Bukayo Saka story is so beautiful because it's almost like it's, it's repeated itself in a generation so much younger. You then can really look at Arsenal and say, this black heritage and lineage is in the DNA of the club. It wasn't just a phase that happened in the middle of, you know, the 80s or something. I mean, you might look at, I remember feeling like Arsenal had a real French heritage to it. Now, if you look at the current squad, that French heritage isn't quite as prominent as it was beforehand, you know, in the like, early 2000s. But when you've got someone like Bukayo Saka, who really you can draw such a straight line from Ian Wright to Saka, even the fact that he went to Hale End, came up in the ranks as a Londoner, speaks with a London accent, has a London vibe. Do you know what I'm saying? All of those things, it ends up just kind of exciting you about a new lease of life within the fan base. And, you know, if you talk to a lot of match day attending fans and stuff like that, they'll talk about the Emirates feeling younger in the last few years. You know, they'll talk about you know, there was like a kind of juvenile excitement in the Emirates, especially kind of late Arteta years, you know what I mean, the last couple of years. And there's no doubt that Kyo Saka has dragged a whole generation of young Londoners and especially young black Londoners. And that representation role he's provided for us ends up being something that kind of brings along this whole fan base that wants to see it go well. So... I don't think there's been a player in my lifetime I've been more desperate to see lift a big trophy than Bukayo Saka because his name will be etched in Arsenal greatness, you know, alongside your Ian Wrights or Thierry and Rizzo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I feel like, you know, give it 30, 40, 50 years, mark my words, you walk to the Emirates and there'll be a statue of him. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of like, he, he represents so much. Even the darkest moment of maybe his career, I'm speaking for him, but when he missed that penalty for England and it felt like half the entire nation turned on him in that moment, I think it even made his representation and the way in which we could relate to him even more palatable because so many young black people know the feeling of, oh man, it was all going well and then it was like he turned black in front of everyone again. And so I think even when he went through things like that, it felt like I could feel like the Arsenal fan base were even more behind this brother than they were beforehand. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, man, it's a very beautiful thing to see someone like that who represents that doing so well. 
And I just, oh man, I just wanted to lift up a trophy. Do you know what I'm saying? Like a real, he won the Premier League. Do you know what I'm saying? And it will happen. I'm sure of it. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I can just echo that just to say that his experience is our experience. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the way that the Arsenal family kind of wrapped their arms around him meant a lot to him. And it meant a lot to me as a black Arsenal fan to, to see that. 100%. I love the way that even the stadium represents so much of what we're talking to. Every time I walk in, I look up and I see that Arsenal Nigeria flag at the top right hand corner. Then you see the montage and the collage of all of these like Arsenal fans and they just it looks like the stadium and you know, to have that is what welcomes you into the stadium and then a massive welcome to North London. It's they get they get it, you know, the identity that runs through the club. It's, it's it's exciting to see it play out, not just in the players, but also the literal the literal building, you know. I've got an idea, just as the last thing before I let you go, I've got an idea. I don't know That's how it. the flag thing runs in there, but I'd love to see a flag up there with um the Deportivo La Coruña goalkeeper on the floor with Yeah. With Carnu doing the you know the juju goal, you know the I mean, Do you know what I mean? Thing. That would just be that would be everything. Like, let's work out how we can get Kanye. Talk to the power. I mean, you're you're in. Do you know what I mean? So talk to the powers that be. You're famous now, Femi. So, so like, I'll appreciate listen, it. Man. Listen, <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I can't remember anyone leaving a Nigeria shirt in my dressing room when I was. Doing Say that. no more. You know All right, I mean? I'm so going to talk to the powers that be and see how far we get. Let's work on this, Femi Kodiaso. Tell us something about um, the Black Arsenal book from your perspective, and um, we're both in it, and what an honour it is. Yeah. Honestly, it's such an honour to be in it. I think the book is so eloquently put together. It's beautiful. It's because it's... What is so great is you get so many perspectives of this thing we all have in common. You see it from a black woman's perspective. You see it from a player's perspective. You see it from myself, just being a musician that's a super fan. You see it from people that live, breathe and work with Arsenal, people that write about it every day. And when you've got this collage of all of these kind of perspectives you find yourself in the book and that's what that's what was most exciting for me getting through it so yeah so honored to be a part of it and so grateful to have a copy of it talking of heroes and superheroes this next contributor is very special to me i grew up looking at the photos of eddie achir you might have seen some of his seminal pictures of hip-hop legends wu-tang clan biggie smalls most def and talib Kweli his beautiful pictures of Aaliyah, some of the last taken before she passed. He's also photographed and been part of London's jungle and drum and bass scene. Eddie's pictures have a rhythm. Eddie talks with a rhythm. So it felt right to ask him to vocalise his contribution to the Black Arsenal book. So with no further ado, here's The Margins, read by Eddie Achir. I was a modern fan before the modern fan existed. I had no interest in the game of football apart from youthful exuberance and the chance to kick something hard and fast. A snap of the hip, a slap of the foot hitting the ball and the curving arc as it disappeared into the distance. Have it. I didn't care about accuracy or trying to score a goal. The force of hitting it, driving it far, far away was what I was interested in. The intricate etiquette and tribalism of football moved grimly over my head. I didn't care who played where or why or how your allegiance to your team was imported under the skin of your being. I was not spending long hot summer evenings playing rush goalie or headers and volleys. Football was something that happened over there to other people. But Ian Wright changed that. I learned about football and the Arsenal because Ian Wright, with his explosions of joy every time he scored, made me. I supported him and through him learned the ways of football, or at least enough of it not to be shamed in a conversation about trophies and formations and who had the best sponsorship logo on their shirt or to briefly show an interest as another World Cup or Euros rolled around. And St. George's flags appeared from nowhere to be dragged outside windows bearing allegiance to a country that nurtured me, but only grudgingly supported my existence. I supported one player, Wrighty. 
following his career from the time he was underrated to the time he was overrated and then after that in that slow twilight decline to become properly appreciated with his legacy secured. The data that governs modern football can't tell you about the times that matter. These are the moments where that stats make no sense. There is a sense of a magic about them, riding aloft that mystical wave and there's a black horse ridden by Ian Wright charging down out of Broccoli into the sunset down Woolwich High Street. The Arsenal is itself a simulacrum, hailing from the south, moving to the north and embodying the spirits of the two cities, north and south London. Its name does not preclude its village associations, but rather, like some Chaucerian character, it is the Arsenal, last of the English clubs to hold a definite article in front of their name after incorporation. It is a stop on the underground and a well-marketed construct of the values of London and holds more than the villages of Chelsea, Brentford, West Ham, Tottenham, Millwall, Crystal Palace will ever hold. That said, it's 1994, and that year London has its own defining sound that resounded across the planet. We called it Jungle. And its baseline shook the very foundations of what London was capable of doing. That season, Arsenal had finished 12th, Chelsea 11th, and I cared nothing for the margins. That carnival, you'd hear M beat and General Leaves incredible everywhere. And in that video, you'll see a Ute shucking out in the 1993 Adidas Arsenal away kit. I remember myself there, the JBC logo adorning the shirt and a Sega Saturn game controller in my hand as I played J-League Super Soccer, the Japanese edition of Virtua Soccer. The future is written around me as the sounds of the 21st century are being crafted by the producers in London, North, South, East and West. I'm just about to leave the house, camera in my bag, red Ralph Lauren shirt, machino trousers, white Reebok workouts, Greenstone Island jacket, next pants and Arsenal socks. Wrighty's Arsenal meant jungle, fashion and football. It was nothing for me being a Stockwell kid to hop on a Northern line and travel 10 stops to my job in Camden Market. In Camden, I was exposed to an aesthetic which was sharp and meant there was no question where you were coming from. Woodhouse on Upper Street was the epicenter of a kind of London reseller of anything Italian. There was Massimo Osti, Stone Island, CP Company, then Camden Market for Diesel and Kung Fu Slippers. The style of my times using jungle and football had transitioned off the terraces because it was situated in an area of London that held its own. Gave space to the culture was populated by locals fashioned in their post-work finery. Those North London lads all held themselves up with a working class pride in Ralph Lauren and Reeboks. You could say every village in London has a look and some villages have stronger looks than others. Then there were the clubs. The Astoria on Sunday for roast, the YMCA Tottenham Court Road on Tuesday night and Thunder and Joy, Orange at the Rocket on Holloway Road and AWOL at the Paradise and Angel. Man Man was geared up in Versace, Machino, Ralphie, Armani, Paul Smith. Name brands cause their youths work hard for the money. So now comes time to show and prove. When Arsenal made right in one of theirs, the South came with him. We continue to see his rude boy go on to prove himself for London as the greatest of all time. Nike made an advert about him out on the Hackney Marshes. The surprise of seeing that celebration as he scored against every man them on those green fields, a cheeky chirpiness or park-like encapsulating mischief that whirled around him. It's no surprise his prowess in the league was never matched when he played for the kingdom. Furthermore, England will never have the coach England deserves because she will only ever be allowed to bring science, skill and magic to the women's game. Ask Alex, whose his greatest teacher was, and it'd be his mother. England never had the centre forwards it held in its ranks on the field. Wrighty had 33 caps and 9 goals. So many opportunities to show that energised magic denied. So many times a scapegoat for the kingdom's failure. Never truly appreciated by the kingdom, Wright was always appreciated by the Arsenal. The rude boy hero front and centre. 179, just done it! Blazoned on his shirt and carried in our hearts. My love for the Arsenal is entwined with my love for Ian Wright. I should have gold tooth in his grin as he curls over, laughing at his own joke. The unconfined joy and pain as he kicks every ball and stretches every sinew in the analyst chair. 
He is South London's glory. Bernie Price time with the Arsenal. Eddie's got a new photograph book out called The Spirit of the Lens. Make sure you seek it out. Big shout out also to SPMC, amazing drummer bass MC and massive Arsenal fan for the use of his track Don Gargon Talk. My final guest is one that Arsenal podcast fans will know well. She's a podcaster. She's a journalist. She's a producer. She's a legend. Let's hear from Amy Lawrence talking about her chapter in this Black Arsenal book, Where Are My Brothers? Amy Lawrence, thank you for speaking to me as ever. Uh, Amy, listen, I spoke to you a couple of years ago. I interviewed you for an audio program I was making about Ian Wright. And something you said then, which has stuck with me. And you said to me that one of the strengths of him was how he made a North London white girl like you feel as included as he did a South London uh, black man like me. Can you expand on that? You know, it's kind of symptomatic about how you feel about Arsenal as a whole and perhaps about your involvement in this book. That's quite a lot of things to think about in one <laughs> in one answer. I suppose it's probably normal that when I got approached to take part in this book, I was really delighted and proud and honoured, but also a little bit anxious. It's really hard when you know that you're participating in something about a specific scenario that relates to certain people that might not have your shared experience. And you might feel like an ally and you might feel like a friend and you might try and understand, but you're not in necessarily those people's shoes. It's complicated. <laughs> um, and for people who try and be open-minded and broad-minded and kind of believe in the goodness of people irrespective of anything that might be a perceived divider it still feels like am I as a white person the right voice to uh, express things about black arsenal so it did need a little bit of thought <laughs> and a bit of care but I think in the end it just felt like such a big part of my Arsenal experience and what I loved about Arsenal, particularly as a kid, as a teenager in the 1980s. Because I remember a very vivid and strong feeling and proud feeling of how distinctive and special Arsenal was in terms of British football clubs at that time. Because it didn't feel to me like anywhere else was as welcoming, not just to black people, but to anyone, really. Uh, at a time when football was suffering from uh, some pretty hideous, toxic vibrations in terms of, you know, crowds weren't great at that time. And if you ask yourself why, one of the reasons is it didn't feel safe, it didn't feel welcoming didn't feel very nice. It was hostile. That was part of what football was as an experience. And somehow Arsenal was stood a little bit apart from the rest. And it wasn't just having black players, but it, and it wasn't just having black fans. And I definitely was conscious of seeing black faces in the North Bank and imagining that that probably wasn't the case <laughs> at most uh, home ends of grounds in that era. But there was also, you know, multifaceted everything. There was every age you could imagine, every shade you could imagine, probably every religion you could imagine. Um, and gender, you know, you could go if you were uh, not a bloke and it was okay. And that wasn't the case everywhere. And I really remember going to certain grounds, certain places and almost feeling a bit uh, superior, which I don't know whether that's the right thing, but I felt like, every, you know, other clubs, uh, you know, it was easy to look down on the fact that they were much more 
uh, closed. And I think that openness and that, wa that natural warmth and that natural cosmopolitan vibe of Arsenal, which was reflective of London uh, at that time, was immense. It, it, it made you feel bigger somehow. I don't know, you'd go away from home and it'd be like, it was a bit of a strut in the step of, 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 of our crew because we were different to everybody else. We had something extra. We were cooler, frankly. Well, that's what I felt anyway. Seasoned Amy Lawrence listeners know about one of your famous and favourite trips to Liverpool uh, away with Arsenal, watching us win the title in 89. We've heard that one before, but in the Black Arsenal book, you talk about another time on Merseyside with a more negative outcome. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was the same season. Um, Arsenal played at Everton uh, in 89 in the, in the lead up, uh, in the winter time of that season. And Everton were, um, you know, they'd been league champions a couple of times in the, in the seasons quite <laughs> not long before that. And it was a big old game and I was really excited to go to, to a match like this. And it was a match where Arsenal on the pitch really showed their credentials and actually got a standing ovation from the Everton fans, which was felt very telling because Arsenal were trying to win the league and these guys knew how to do it and they respected that. But there was a, a, a off the pitch atmosphere that couldn't have been a stronger contrast. I remember what felt very much like the majority of Everton supporters singing a song that I don't know that I can say out loud, uh, out loud, but it involved shooting people of colour in a derogatory term. And I swear to God, I, I'd never heard anything like that in my life. I was absolutely horrified and Arsenal had three black players in their midfield that day Dave Rocastle, Michael Thomas and Paul Davis and the response from the Arsenal supporters in the away end was amazing because a majority white set of fans by a street were just up in arms defending their own spashing the wooden seats making a real noise Arsenal, Arsenal it was like hairs on the back of the neck, kind of like a really defiant response. And I remember hanging about after the game uh, near the sort of players' entrance exit in those days. It wasn't a lot of security or anything like that. You could just loiter and, uh, and sort of <laughs> hang about. And uh, the players were coming out and when Rocky came out, one of the Everton supporters said to him, hey, Rocky, come and sign for a great club. And Rocky looked him dead in the eye and said, what, get shot? Oh, I was absolutely awestruck. If, <laughs> if I wasn't already by the player, I certainly was by the man. And that was Rocky. Um, and that was Arsenal. There's another story you tell in the Black Arsenal book, and it's one that Paul Davis also mentioned at the Black Arsenal launch. It's about Kevin Campbell and the mural. It's actually the title of the chapter of your book, Where Are My Brothers? I'm going to get people to read it, mm. but it does give me a good chance to talk about a player who I know you feel strongly and passionately about, and that is Kevin Campbell. So just tell us something about, in the spirit of what we're talking about, the Black Arsenal book, tell us what Kevin Campbell represented in, in that sense. Kevin was an immense personality, but he was also uh, maybe a little bit more politically and socially switched on than most and I think it says a lot when we talk about that story and just very, very briefly, uh, some will know about the mural, which was uh, basically a huge artwork that was put up to cover the um, building works while the North Bank was redeveloped from the old terrace into a big two-tier stand. And it was done without a great deal of care and attention. And I think just some artists put, kind of got some generic, random people-type looking folks and they sort of copy and pasted it to fill this <laughs> enormous expanse of uh, uh you know to cover up the the whole whole of the north bank and the day before i think their first game at home the players came down and had a training session there so they could kind of get used to it because it was a bit weird 
playing into a an you know a, an empty space if you like and kev was the one who noticed and not just noticed but had the balls really to bring it up to david dean who was vice chairman of the club and when david said oh you know what do you think a few of the think a few of the players were there and he'd come down to see them to see what they thought about it all because he was quite proud of this idea to try and make it better than looking at a bit like a building site and playing in front of that for the best part of the season and kevin went but mr dean where are my brothers and how perfect a, a, a thing to say, but also how courageous when you think about him being 20, maybe, or 21 at the time, young man, and that being one of the most important senior executive people at the football club. And he did it with a touch of class and you know, that twinkle and, and genuine warmth that, that he oozed, you know, and it, I think, that, you know, David being who he was, immediately was like, oh, my God, that was an absolutely horrendous oversight. We will fix it as soon as possible, which they did. And they got the painters in and kind of patched it up to make it more representative. But, you know, I think maybe some older players maybe not did, wouldn't necessarily have put their head above the parapet, but Kev would, because Kevin was really principled about things and just didn't believe in staying silent. And I think, I guess, again, it's speaking as someone who's not in those shoes, but I suspect that you have quite a lot of inner battles sometimes about, do I say something, do I not say something, um, when there is a matter that is hurtful or problematic, or it might just be an oversight, but it, or it might be meant, but are you brave enough to tackle it and? take on what might be some backlash or are you going to just get on with it and and when you look back at the history i think of black footballers when they first came into football most of them felt that they had to just shut up and withstand the atmosphere that was around at that time you know things disguised as banter thinly veiled horrible comments uh or worse were considered things that it was best if you, you know, stood tall, stood strong and did your talking on the pitch. And it takes a certain kind of personality to say, actually, I can talk off the pitch as well. I'm strong enough to bring these things to the surface. No, I think what you say is right. And I mean, you just mentioned there about it's hard to talk while not being directly in those shoes. I mean, I can tell you, having been in those shoes, that having the words chippy chucked at you, confrontational whenever you do pick up on these things. Um, so to have a Kevin Campbell, you know, to have later on you know, Ian Wright standing up and being Black London, that made like such a difference to me, my confidence, helping me navigate a world which is very often hostile. You know, I had a great chat a few years ago with Paul Mortimer, who said to me that he was nicknamed Morty Mandela at Charlton simply you know, for standing up for himself. So those kind of interventions that you're talking about main, meant a great deal to somebody you know, looking on. Those, hearing those kind of stories made you stand taller and made you proud. Yeah, I think that's, you know, you mentioned Ian right there and it's hard to overstate how important he was, I think. Just that... The personality, the heart on the sleeve, the exuberance, the way he walked into a room or walked onto a football pitch and like, you know, everybody knew about it. He, he, there was a, he was like a force of nature and you couldn't take your eyes off him. And I think the fact that he had that effervescence in his personality but also again you look on the, the picture that they chose to be on the front cover of the book which is an amazing picture it's it's a I don't know it's a it's a salute that means I'm standing tall look at me I'm not bowing down it you know and, and his his goal celebrations were so full of like this like there was something it, there was so much in them there was like emotion and sweetness and fun but also kind of this this determination this sort of i am who i am vibe and 
I think that that was really important because he was different. The way he carried himself was different as a footballer. It was so exciting. And especially at a club like Arsenal, old fashioned marble halls, you know, um, Bank of England, the traditional club, Arsenal class and all that. And Wrighty came in and shook it all up. But it was they were perfect for each other. And that was another thing that was so great because he almost challenged some of those stereotypes about what, you know, Arsenal was supposed to represent. But he represented a new Arsenal. There's been an awful lot of talk in this book um, in general about, you know, Ian Wright, um, Thierry Henry, that level of black excellence, even more recent um, names like Rocky and Michael Thomas. It's great to see... Paul Davis being part of this book and being part of the launch. Um, there are also other black players at Arsenal predating some of the ones that always get mentioned. I'm going to mention Chris White. I'm going to mention Viv Anderson, Raphael Mead, Gus Caesar, and of course, Brendan Batson. Viv Anderson is probably the guy who um, had the most influence when I was, you know, really watching closely uh, at Arsenal. And he was just so unbelievably good. He was such a good footballer for Vanderson. Uh, he kind of, I'm trying to think who he reminds There's something Ben Whitish in a way, in the sense that he had this wonderful ability and stamina and he dominated and he was always brilliant, but he was quiet with it. Didn't make a big fuss about himself. He wasn't a noisy guy. I just thought Viv Anderson was an immense footballer. Um, he almost felt too good somehow, if you know what I mean. I think I was slightly in awe because he he, he had such a strong interna international experience as well. You know, someone who had loads of England caps, that was a big deal back then. Maybe it's a bit different now, I think, because people could get to 100 caps sort of by their mid-20s and it feels mad because when you grew up in the 70s and 80s, if you, you know... If you got past 50 caps, that was a real massive achievement. It didn't, just didn't play as many matches, I don't think. Uh, so there wasn't that same capacity to get to those massive numbers. But that group of players that you mentioned, just being a part of a top side was, you know, it was really important. It was that visibility thing. It, things were beginning to change slowly. But what you really needed was the absolute stars to just kick it on that next level. You know, I like to give you the final word also, Amy. So um, a final word from you about the Black Arsenal book. I think not only is this an important book, it's utterly beautiful. It's a thing of style and substance. Um, the imagery, the production, it's a serious book. I couldn't recommend it enough. So that's it. It just leaves time for me to thank Andrew for giving up some precious Ask Cast time for something as important as this. Normal service will be resumed by Monday. Hopefully at that point, Norman Jay and the rest of that mob will be crying into their beers. Come on, you gunners. Thank you so much to Tayo for putting that together. Some really, really interesting insights and observations from some really, really interesting people around a, a book that if you don't already own, should be very close to the top of your shopping list right now. Black Arsenal by Clive Nwanka and Matthew Harl is available now in all good bookshops, but you could ask your local independent bookshop to order it in for you specially. They would love your business and you still get your hands on an amazing book as well. Right, I'm going to leave it there for this particular episode. Obviously, there is a lot going on this weekend. There is the small matter of the North London Derby. There's a lot for Arsenal to consider, as we spoke about a bit earlier with Sam Dean. We will hear from Mikel Arteta tomorrow, Friday, in his pre-game press conference. And you can join us on Patreon as we look ahead to this game in a bit more detail. And by a bit, I mean a lot more detail. If you're not already a member, you can get instant access to everything that we do on Patreon for just $6 a 
a month. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash arsebog. Patreon.com forward slash arsebog. Myself and Lewis will have that preview podcast for you at some point late afternoon. So if you fancy getting on board, please do come join us. In the meantime, take it easy, folks. Hope you all have an amazing weekend for very obvious reasons. James and I will be here on Monday with an Arsecast Extra. For now, though, take it easy, folks. Thanks again for listening, and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye.